Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Matthew Marsden Show. This is something that I'm going to be doing every Monday, not necessarily with this individual, but I'm going to be dropping a video every Monday now, Marsden Mondays, so uh, you can get some consistency. And I can be a little bit more regulated in my life, right? So I know that I've got to do something at this particular time. Now, Marsden Mondays is going to launch with a very, very special individual. Now, I'm going to embarrass Tom now, uh, but it's very rare, or I think it's very rare that you get to use the word legend, uh, or it should be rare that you get to use the word legend. And Tom Struthers is absolutely and most definitely a legend in the film industry. I'm just going to give you a little bit of his resume. Tom has been a a stuntman and a stunt coordinator and a second unit director on a bunch of films, uh, mainly the ones that you guys, well, you'll know all of them, but the ones I'm going to tell you about, he was a stunt coordinator on Inception. He was a stunt coordinator on The Dark Knight. He was stunt coordinator on X-Men First Class, uh, Shadow Recruit, I could, Dunkirk. I could go on and on and on. Uh, the last One of the last movies he did was Dune, which is one of the greatest movies I think uh, that I've seen in the past 20 years. So uh, with no further ado, I want to welcome my friend to the Matthew Marsden Show, Tom Struthers. Thank you, my friend, for coming on. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Um, well, thank you for that introduction. I don't know if it's all that warranted, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, it's and, warranted. Oh, no, I think, oh, I don't know. I think we're here because of a lot of good people help and believe in us during our careers. And I think that's where it, it starts and it gets to, you know, gives us the opportunities that we do and what we love to do. Well, you know, like a, a true master at his craft, you're very humble. And, you know, it's funny as an actor, when you start out as an actor, certainly for me in the UK and, you know, the initially the kind of level of stunts that you get to first is like, I'm going to be doing the stage fighting, right? Like this is the way you throw a punch. Um, yeah. You know, and, and you learn very quickly that if you're a millimeter off or whatever, on, on stage anyway, you know, you can clock someone and it can be a very, very bad day. Um, so, so then when you move, when you move further up the, the flagpole, as it were, and you get into these giant movies, stunts become very, 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 very important. And having a, uh, having a competent stunt coordinator is everything because i mean it, I, I remember thinking well you know nothing can really go wrong uh, and it can go wrong but you have to have the best people that have an attention to detail uh, and yeah. you've been on some of the be the biggest movies of all time right uh, yeah um oh touch wood look i've been really lucky matthew i i had a great start um i was just a bush kid in australia that was actually in kenya um, in East Africa uh, at the time working with horses etc and farming and I met one of the true great stunt coordinators second unit directors of our day Simon Crane um, and him and his um, Spanish uh, assistant coordinator guy called Jordi Casares they took a like to me for some reason I was just mid-20s kid just I was a little bit out there um, running around Africa doing my thing and I'd been born and bred in the Australian outback and I had the opportunities that a lot of kids in my uh, era did not have. I got to travel. And um, next thing I know, you know, I got offered a job. And, you know, they're like, would you like to come work for us again? You know, after seeing what I did with horses and, you know, I'd already, I was already a pilot and, and I parachuted. So I had a little bit of, of the action background and, and some training and weapons, et cetera. And, and, um, and then next thing I know, um, I'm on Braveheart, you know, and that was wow. my, first, my first big film. I was, I was this young kid and, you know, I was, you know, more testosterone and then, than one necessarily should have, I suppose, running around, swinging a sword, <laughs> riding a horse and, and um, drinking, drinking and partying and doing what you do when you're young and out of control. But, you know, going back to that, I had an unbelievable start and, and, um, I met some great people and I worked on some great projects for set 10 years for Simon. I was part, I became part of his team and it was, I did my apprenticeship, you know, and I was yeah. this little kid, Australian, African, and, and here I was and on some of the biggest film sets of the day. And at the time, I think I didn't consider it or take it into 
that these were the films of the of the 1990s and 2000s, you know, and um, and they're iconic, like Braveheart and Private Ryan and Titanic and films like that. And I was there for the full run of these films as this young kid and learning the trade. And and um, I've always got that to thank for. And then, you know, Simon Crane put me forward to join the English Stunt Register, which I considered to be one of the most disciplined at the time, um, one of the most disciplined stunt uh, fraternity anywhere in the world um, with their training and the qualifications you needed to attain so you could be part of our industry. So that was a fantastic um, start to my career. And um, and I think that it was – we don't see enough of it now, to be honest with you. We don't see enough yeah. of people where I get to my age and level in the industry now and I do try to always – give someone an opportunity, I think. And, but I was given the most unbelievable opportunities between, you know, Simon Crane to start with. And then another gentleman who went on has gone on to be a great second unit director, Paul Jennings, um, on the first dark and second, uh, of the dark Knight series. And before I did inception and then on, he went off and did something else and he gave me blessing. But, um, yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate, you know, and, you know, to go to your thing about the safety and, and about how things grow. I think when we get to our position, we're more about risk assessment and safety officers in our own right uh, to give the best performance that we can give or can get achieved with either the cast or the performers so that, you know, our um, legacy, if you will, or or our trade is still accepted and, and um, furthered in the business. You know, we've been making live action films for over a hundred years now. And um, I think the great films stand out that people, they don't, they don't, they don't approach it in a simplistic way, but what they do is what they put in that frame, whatever director or DOP wants to see is good. And they, they, it goes back to the one thing, concentrating on the small things. Like you just said a minute ago, it's, it's taking consideration and always, always, trying to achieve the best or better than what the last person achieved. And that's part of, I suppose, the, the development of our industry. Like on the camera side, look what's happened in our careers, you know, going from, mm -hmm. you know, 35 mil to the start of digital age with Alexa. And now we're into, you know, 8K, shooting 8K digital, you know. Yeah, I remember when um, I think it was George Lucas was shooting one of the first people to shoot digital. Yeah. And everyone was like, what is he doing? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. this is crazy. And it, it's, it's really difficult to even comprehend now that you could be shooting on film because, you know, uh, uh, digital gives you so much flexibility. But I do feel yeah. with the advent of digital, people have kind of taken it a little bit too far as far as um, in the stunt industry anyway, because they're CGI in a lot of stuff. And I like, I miss a lot of the, um, you know, practical special yeah. effects and the practical stunts. There, there's nothing like going and doing stunts and seeing those things, seeing people on wires being yanked across, um, you know, hundreds of feet, someone jumping off. I mean, I, I, just, um, I just watched the latest Mission Impossible and I knew it, I knew that that one particular stunt was coming up, right? I knew that he'd done, Tom had done that stunt, you know, riding the bike off. Uh, and yeah. parachuting I knew and I was so excited to see it because I mean look I wouldn't do that uh, you know, I've done a lot of things I've jumped out of planes Tom you know I've done my I've done I've hung off the side of uh little birds and whatever I would yeah. not do that like that is something else but it's you know you, you it still grabs you right it's it's yeah. still awesome I think the rawness of it Matthew I think the rawness of of it and I think that you know we've we've gone through a period um in our film, in our film careers, in the last ten years, where you know um, your company, your big companies like Marvel, and you know all your big visual effects films, you know they've been accepted, and and now, but I think people are going back to wanting to see more grounded. Um, there's always a, a market for everything, I think, you know, and but I think that the, I think the the technology of of our smartphone. I mean, there's nothing that. I can think of our smartphone can't answer right now. Uh, you've got mm -hmm. YouTube, you've got, you've got every platform you would like to have on it. But also, 
that means that everything that we do is now exposed all over the world. India, China, Southeast Asia, America, wherever. You can log on and you can look up yourself or myself or, you know, look up anything and or see any movie or program or, you know, battle zone or whatever. So I think people have gone back a little bit to saying, well, hang on a minute. You know, we love our escapism and that's great, but can we see some more rawness? Can we see some more reality? And I think that's and, one and of the I things- think that's reflected in storylines as well. I mean, we, we were talking about this a little bit before we came on, like, sto- you know, yeah. doing great stories and understanding yeah. that. I mean, you know this because, you know, progressing on to be second unit and I mean, and I, I want to ask you about that. I want you to explain that to people in a minute but let me just step back a bit to what you said about um about apprenticeships because i think that that is like super super important and the knock-on that that has so um whenever anyone says to me i want to go and do a film degree i tell them don't do a film degree go and be a runner on a set like go and get the experience because the the truth of the matter is is if you are you go to NYU film school, right? You're going to, you're going to rack up a ton of debt or even USC. I mean, USC, you get a great education, right? There's no two ways about it. You get a great education, but when you go and set, you start off at the bottom again, you know, the amount of people that I know that have got 200 grand's worth of debt and they're runners on movies. I'd rather say, listen, take that money, go on to set, right? Instead, like let go and take jobs, that that you can take minimum wage on or whatever, or even under minimum wage if you can do it. Like, you know, certainly in Europe and, and where you are, you're over in Morocco, um, you can go and get on these sets. And if and if someone, the, the funny thing about the industry, and you know, I, I don't want to talk that much about the wokeness in it, but the, the funny thing about the industry is actually for years and years and years, it was merit-based, right? It was merit-based. Yeah. If you were there and you delivered even if you're a runner, you turn up, you're on, you know, you're on time, you do your job, you're going to get promoted. You're going to go up the totem pole for the most part, right? Yeah. And that's what you did, right? Like you started yeah. off, they saw your talent and they're like, hey, kid, come on, you're coming with us. That, I, yes, exactly that. I mean, I was so lucky about it. I think, I think today, look, the, the world has changed a lot. The industry has changed a lot. Um, we touched on a little bit before, but I think that the industry – really just needs to leave we 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 are you know creative let let the creative people back in the door that's what i'm saying you know and give the people who want to dedicate their life to this because you know i i I knew a very very long time ago matthew i'm never going to be a president or a prime minister or someone that you can look up in 50 years 100 200 years time and say oh you know that person had an impact on society but if I stay true and, and really try to make good creative choices in, in projects I do, then and those projects are recognized, even in 100, 200 years' time, everything's digitized now. Everything could be, I don't know what the next level of digit, you know, like will be, but you can, you can look up and they go, oh, shit, that person did five of these projects. Sorry, that person yeah. did five of these projects. And, um, you know, and this is what, they were fantastic or they were bad, whatever they choose. But that's our legacy. That's what I decided early in my career and my life. My legacy will be to try to do, and I've been, look, touch wood, I've been so lucky, you know, to work for directors, you know, like Nolan and Martin Campbell and, you know, Dennis Villene. They are creative people who want to do original content, you know, and, so much today I see that, you know, a lot of people are doing a lot of remakes, which, you know, some are, I, some are valid in, in my opinion, some are not, but everyone has an opinion, which is what a part of what we do is. Um, but I just think that having more creative input from all the people means that you start in the business and you start moving through, whether you become an AD or an actor or, or a producer or a director, you all start somewhere. You know, like, for example, you know, I can name a few people like Simon Crane, who was one of my mentors. You know, he's 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 had a fantastic fantastic uh, career. Like Kevin Delanoy, unbelievable producer, line producer, executive producer, producer. You know, he started his career. I remember him on Braveheart as a location manager. Yeah. And he's produced things like Ali and Blood Diamond and one, you know, Batman's and all these films. And because 
they know they're creatively bought through. So I agree with you on that. I think that the 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 world has changed. I, I think having an apprenticeship and making people aware that we need to bring the people in is would be a big move forward. Um, but in this day and age, it seems to be like, oh, you know, you don't have a piece of paper that says that, you know, yeah. you're a genius. And um, so therefore, you know, we don't have a job for you. I think sometimes there's a balance. I think, you know, going to higher education um, definitely helps people in life. But also think that the people who choose to go straight into our business, um, whether it might be on props or on special effects or stunts like I, my side or, or, or acting and you know, you can you can go a different route. You know, you can come through the ranks, and I think that it makes for yeah. better filmmakers who come through the ranks. Even people like Spielberg and Simon Crane, and and you know, using the big names, you know, um, they all served an apprenticeship. They all went through on levels of of uh, in the business. Well, I think it also makes for a level of humility. Right, that you yeah. know that at the end of the day, you know that number one, if you don't, look, we all know if you don't have talent, you really don't progress, or that, that's the way it used to be, right? You had but to have talent to progress, but also but you any, had to have, sorry, go on. Sorry, but in any workforce in the world, in a normal workforce, if you're very good at what you do and you know, and, and you pro progress and, and you know, you cross the T's and dot the I's and you do a good job and you show initiative and you show that you have vision. It, 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 it can be in any walk of life. You know, you will, you will move up because that's the ambition. You know, um, you know, we, most humans and most people have an ambition to reach somewhere in life or do something in life. Um, and given the opportunities and touch wood, some people, you know, some of us, get more opportunities than others. That's just a fact of life. I, I think that I was given more opportunities than some other people I know and who are just as talented but never reached the same level as I have at the moment. Um, hopefully, you know, they'll do well, but it's creating opportunities too. It's having a drive, you know? Yeah, but that, that is part and parcel of it. I mean, you have to take the opportunities when they come. And I think that that what you've detailed as well, because, you know, when, you, when we started off this interview, you're we like, I'm so grateful for all these other people. Uh, and and that's an admirable quality, right? Because you look and you do know, you know, look, if that person hadn't have seen me that one day and they hadn't have said, hey, yep. I'm going to give you a shot, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, it is an act of generosity, right? Now, uh, it doesn't yes. mean it's an act of charity, right? It's not no. an act of charity. It's an act of generosity no. to give someone, to pay it forward, as it were. Yeah. Right, exactly, and and that's what you're looking to do as well, right? I mean, I'm, you know, I, I know Always. that you've given a bunch of people um, opportunities. I know that, um, sure. and and then it's up to them whether or not they grasp it. And but, but conversely, yeah. like we said before, you know, you're a very black and white person when it comes to these things, and you're like, okay, this is either good or it's not good. You know, this is this or this is that. So I, I personally love that because I know where I stand, right? And I don't think that it is, um, you know, I know a lot of pe people get their feels, of, you know, offended by it. But to me, I love that. And, and certainly with, when you're working with second unit, when you're working with directors, you know, you want someone to come in because, you know, you are, I don't say like more than stunts because that's like, I, I don't I don't mean that to be derogatory to stunts, but, no. you know, some, you know what I mean? You, you're a second unit director as well, which means you are, uh, um, you have a you have a separate set of skills, and not everyone has that. Not every stunt person has that. It's like you know Chad yeah. and those guys moved on, and they went and they directed, and they've they've had massive successes like Chad has. And they've John done Wick. and they've done fantastic for the business. You know Chad and Dave Leach and and people of of their caliber. You know they've done amazing, and um, you know hats off to them for that. And you know they've created massive content, and people love. And you're absolutely right. I think, look, I remember, I remember the day I was, I literally, I joined, I joined um, a thing that Simon Crane was doing called Young Indiana Jones in Kenya because they needed some more horses. And a good friend of mine, I had a lot of ponies at that time. He called me up and said, can we use some of your horses? And, um, and we need some uh, young guys to, to be, to be um, English soldiers. Uh, cover riding a horse, and I'm like, okay. 
I remember the day specifically as I'd finished, we'd been riding all day and doing pieces on horses and that. And some of my horses were a bit ropey and that. So, and the horse master, a man called Jordi Casara, says, can you come over here? And we sat on a table. It was in the Athi River up on the tablelands outside of Kenya, uh, Nairobi in Kenya. And he said, would you like to come and work for us today? It was at that moment when I said to him, well, yeah, if you're paying U.S. dollars in an air ticket, I'll come work for you. <laughs> and it was a very small amount of U.S. dollars in those days because I was just, even though I was Australian, I was that kid from Africa. So I was on a very much a different level of pay scale than yeah. most people for, for about yeah. five years with Simon. But I remember vividly to this day sitting at this picnic table, looking out as far as you could see across the plains of Africa, getting asked a question, would you like to come and work for us? It was that day my life changed, you know. So, um, yeah, it sometimes, I mean, I do miss ranching and farming, but i got to say it, it, it has been a different life, if, if I could say that. Well, I think that, <laughs> what I'm busy. yeah, when you get to the, and certainly at the level that you've been at, I mean, you've been on, been with the greatest creatives of all time, right? I mean, Amazing. I think of Denny, Denny and, and Chris, they're just just incredible. I mean, I, I could go on and on about how great those guys are. Um, but when you are in that creative process, there is nothing like it in the world, right? It's really difficult to relay it to someone where you're sitting down there and maybe you can relay a story about this. I mean, you, you know, you spoke about looking over. I remember two things that happened to me. Number one, I remember when I got Black Hawk down and I remember yes. I had a, a bottle of champagne in the, in my fridge and I took it around to my mom. Cause I got the call at like two o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I'm doing a Hollywood movie. And I remember knocking on my mom's door and she came down and she was all panicked. And I went, I did it. I got it. I, 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 I'm doing a Hollywood film. And then, you know, that moment when you walk on set and I mean, for you, it's different because you, you, you're in the planning process as well, right? Like you go from the beginning, yeah. but you walk on set and you've been talking about building this set, right? Or, you know, conceptualizing, um, this is what it's going to look like. And you walk on set and these amazing artists have built this world. And yeah. you walk on, you like, this is just unbelievable. And then when everything comes together, right, when the actors come on and, and you know, sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. I'm sure you've been around that a lot, right? But yep. when, when that clicks and everything starts rolling and, and you have the people that are at the, the top of their game or even when I know when I've done stunts before and it goes well, it is like this elation that you've yep. done something that is just unbelievable. And like you say, it's forever. It's, it's our legacy. It, it, it's our legacy. It's there forever. I, I mean, listen, some of the movies I've done, maybe <laughs> I wished I hadn't, but, but, but no, I mean, it, the, the truth of the matter yeah. is I've grown on every single thing I've done, but, but can you tell me some of your experiences um, on these films that, that you, you can share? I mean, you know, I know a lot yeah. of times we, we want to be respectful of the people that we've worked with, but, but certainly like those moments where things have clicked or you've gone, wow, this is something else, or this is, I, I, I am, I know I'm in in the presence of greatness doing great things. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I've been, like, touch wood, I've been very, very lucky to, to have experienced some memorable, great film films. You know, honestly, the first couple of films, like the Pri Private Ryan and Titanic and, and, and Braveheart, there was just so many iconic moments in those when I look back on it now. And I think, Jesus, that was just incredible. I mean, the day, I always remember the day that Matt Damon broke down crying on the bridge, you know, like after the P-50, two P-51s went overhead, you know, one being flown by the great and late Ray Hanna. And, and that, that was just an iconic moment. We were there on set and, and you know, Steven Spielberg's filming this scene with him breaking down on the bridge and crying and, or, you know, it, it, it showed us, I think that moment showed more about the battle inside of what you go through in a war situation than any other piece of the film did. That was just iconic for me. And, and then one of the other iconic 
always remember we were in Chicago and I was working for Paul Jennings running supervising first unit for him um, with um, Chris Nolan on the first Batman. And I was looking up one evening and I was like, wouldn't it be amazing if he was up on top looking down into Gotham City, looking down on us now, Batman? And I said to Chris and Chris was like, no, I don't need that. And then next day he was like, go find me, go, go, go find me a building that you think would be nice <laughs> for him to be on. So I did, I was on, I was on, I went up on pretty much every iconic building in Chicago, you know, the, the Chicago Tribune and the Wrigley building and everyone. We found this one place on the, the main channel that had this great architect here and it had these huge like stone balls. And so we put him up in there and then, uh, they shot from a helicopter and they did a, a heli shot of him looking down in the city, so to speak. So I did that one. And then the next... By the way, everybody knows that shot. I know that shot yeah. right now. I can see it in my head. It's so yep. iconic. And then we get to the next one and Chris was like, no, you don't want to do it again. I said, we have to. It's your trailer shot, Chris. And this is when we flipped the truck and, and all these kind of things up in LaSalle in the main street of Chicago. And so I put him up on Sears Tower this time. And it, was, it wasn't a stunt performer this time. It was Christian Bale. We put a little uh, like safety on him, and he stood on the corner wow. on the corner of Sears Tower, and the helicopter come up and revealed him, him looking down, you know, and hearing all the, the, the chatter and the voices and his thing. And then the funniest was, on the last one, um, I became the overall stunt coordinator and second, uh, um, doing all Chris's work. And, and then... Um, I said to Chris, look, we, we have to do it. He said, Tom, no, I've done it. Two projects. I can never do this again. So I was okay. Um, and I'm a helicopter pilot and fixed wing pilot myself. I have a commercial helicopter license. So I was like, okay. So I took a helicopter from the 34th uh, Street heliport and I flew up around the East River. And they've got this, this amazing bridge in the East River. And it's got this amazing structure on top looking straight down into downtown uh, New York, you know, and, and um, financial district. So I took some uh, shots of it from my iPhone and we flew around it for 10 minutes. And then, and then I, I showed Chris that night. I said, Chris, look at this. Imagine if he was up here. And we were working on that bridge in one of the last days of the movie on Dark Knight Rises. And um, he was like, are you really serious? I said, look, if you <laughs> never use it, let me do it. So he did. You know, the last shot of the film, up on the bridge, up on top. I sent the stunt man and the riggers up there and, and a kid called Bobby Hanton in the suit. They climbed up there. So right on last light, the helicopter came and, and shot them and did things. And, and I think that was the best one of all three. So that's that's something I know I personally contributed iconically uh, with the blessing and the creativity of the director I was working with. And, you know, everyone always remembers those shots. So... Oh yeah, Definitely. I mean, but but the greats, you know, the greats. This is this is one of the funny things about the great directors is they'll take good ideas, yeah. right? I mean, it, and, it might take a little bit of time, you know what I mean? Like it might have to yeah. sink in. I, I I just I'll share a little um thing that happened with me. Well, well, two things that happened with me. I was working with Walter Hill, uh, yep. who is one of the one of the all time greats, right? An amazing screenwriter, wrote Alien. Um, just you know created deadwood and i did an audition for him um that was a like a three-page monologue um about me growing up in southie in boston the character and yeah. the uh, it was a terrific piece of writing like absolutely great and um i was on set with him i got the job and i was on set with him and i said you yeah, know walter i said whatever happened to that monologue and he goes well, well, I don't know. And I said, well, you know, it was just so good. Right? It was just so good. Yeah. Um, I love doing it. I mean, it got me the job, right? Because, it, you know, as you know, when it comes to actors, the material really matters, right? If it's really yeah. great material that you can get your teeth into. And anyway, I'm, I go home. I don't think anything of it. And I think it was like I got up the next morning. Or maybe it was that night. But, it, but I get a call in the middle of the night. And I pick it up and it's Walter. And he goes, do you still remember that monologue? And I went, yeah. <laughs> he goes, now actually you learn it. I learned it. I didn't go in holding the sides, right? And he goes, all right, we're going we're gonna to try and get it tomorrow. And I was like, okay. So we go in 
And he's like, okay, we're just going to try and do it in one shot, right? Let's just try and get it. And so they get the steady cam in. And, uh, you know, you know what it's like, like you're running against the clock, right? You can't be taking multiple takes as you lose it. You, you, you got to get that shot. And so they go, okay, right. Well, let's just give it a go. Right. And they come in with a steady cam and they go, okay. And action. And I start the monologue, blah, 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 blah. Do not mess it up. Right. I get all the way through and I finish it and they go cut. And the whole set goes, Wah! You know, because it's that it's it's that moment where everyone came together. They knew that the writing was good. I nailed it. The DP nailed it. It was the right decision from the director, and it was just a moment that that everything comes together, and and it's it's a rush, right? But but you know, if he was more of an ego, he would have said, "No, oh, I don't want to do that. Like, why would I do that? I, you know, we decided not to do it. That's it." And I think you're saying the same with with Chris as well, like they're not, and, and you know, they're both geniuses, right? They're absolute geniuses, but there's also a humility in the sense that they'll say, oh, that's a good idea. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. That's a good shot. I'll take it. And they are like yeah. the, the shot with it. And I want to ask you about this because the two things that I, I always think of, and it's really strange when you were talking about that was those aerial shots and the, the truck. I mean, that, yeah. that, that truck, I remember watching that because I think shot it in IMAX, right? Yep. That was shot oh, in IMAX. Yep. And I remember going, as an actor, this is one of the curses, right, of being in the industry. You, you break down those scenes in your head. Like, how did they do that? I can't believe that they did that. How many cameras were on that shot, right? And you, you're running through all these things in your head while you're watching it happen and also going, that is just unbelievable and I want, if you can take me through that and then the other one is inception of course i mean inception i looked at that and i was like that wire work is just uh, i've never seen anything like that in my life but but let's um let's talk about that that shot and how you came up with it well with the truck um that was you know sometimes it becomes a little bit of a political football uh with the for real action and and financial gain and and not and uh, going with the visual effects or SFX and stuff. But that was one I felt I really could do. And look, I, I make no bones about it. Uh, Chris Nolan is fantastic to work with for me. He does he does give me a big, let's say a big stick, so to speak. If I really, really push hard on something, he, he will rely on my experience and, and my creative input to – for the action to give him what he wants. He, so that was one I pushed because originally they were like, nah, we don't want to do this for real. You know, we'll do it with wires or we'll do it with visual effects or, you know, you know, other departments were wiring. And I was like, Chris, just trust me on this. I can, I can produce this truck wreck and um, how we discuss. So anyway, so I got with special effects. Um, they, they, Andy Smith and his team, and they were great. And um, they got a boss, Chris Corbalt. Um, you know, they all thought about their ways of doing it. And then I spoke to them about doing it. So they came up with the size of Canon, et cetera, in the trailer. So what we did is we did a rehearsal. It worked really well. Um, the truck was we, – we proved that it could go straight over, not fall sideways, stuff like that, because of danger to crew and, and buildings. Because where they wanted to shoot, it was on um, uh, the financial district part of – Chicago, I believe it's financial district, old banks and that, but it's LaSalle Street. And it's it's a four-lane street, so it's not, you know, 200 Narrow. feet wide. Yeah. yeah. So we get in there. Now, the driver of that truck is an, is an old boy called Jim Wilkie, and he's he's got an amazing story himself, you know. In, he started films back in the 70s, and, uh, you know, he got home from the Vietnam War, and he was a bush kid that decided – he wanted to be in the film business, and he started a little bit like me. He started on John John Ford Western's Wrangling, you know. So hmm. we had a similar start, but amazing driver for for and uh, for this old boy. I mean, even today, I think he's like mid seventies. But you put him in a truck. There's still no one, even in the younger generation out there. You get him in the driver's seat, they can't touch him. It's amazing. Really. Anyway, so he drove it, and we did it. Uh, we did a rehearsal, uh, which. Uh, was in the the chocolate factory, old chocolate factory um, 
that uh, we used, a, uh, we rebuilt as a hospital and they actually blew up for real. Uh, mm -hmm. Heath, with the school bus leaving, Heath walking away, away and stuff like that. Um, and um, they said, okay, we did a rehearsal that worked, to be honest with you, it went amazing. Uh, the truck traveled 28 mile per hour and uh, at a given point, uh, Jim fired the uh, nitrogen cannon in the back of the, the trailer because the truck and trailer then were tied together to prime move in the trailer unit, tractor and trailer unit, and it went end for end. It worked really well. In fact, it worked so well, uh, all we need to do is replace the trailer and we use the same tractor unit in the real one and uh, on film. So we on that shot, and in the shot you'll see, and Chris was like, you know, he put three cameras out, four cameras out, and one of the cameras, I said to him, let's put it in the front of a, this uh, Crown Vic police car. So the police car is driving directly towards, and at the given point, he'll hit the button, flip, and it'll land, bang, in front of the police car. And um, so that's what we did. I drove the police car towards Jim. Jim drove 28 miles an hour, hit the button, and we both stopped safely with it crashing down in front. That is and, ridiculous. That is ridiculous. And whole, yeah, and it was a whole team effort, you know, the, the you know, and... Especially I mean, it's, it's it's so <laughs> iconic now. I mean, that that is so <laughs> iconic, and and you look at how everything melds together, like you say, on in the creative process in making something great. And Chris saying to you, "Okay, go do it," right? Because th th there's so many things that go into that. That's having the balls to give some. Well, first is having the balls to do that stunt because that is insane. <laughs> Right, and then it's having the having the balls to actually say, okay, I'm going to let that person do that stunt, and I'm going to put my not only just reputation. There's a lot that goes into that. There's a lot that can go wrong in those situations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, it, and it's the little things, Matthew, that will catch you out in the bigger in the biggest stunts in the bigger scheme of things. I believe that the amount of like preparation and rehearsal that goes into them it brings that incident. Um, yeah, down. Yeah, so much. Yeah, so much. It brings it so minimal. Where it's the small, it's the small, silly things that will catch you out, or or somebody. You know, I've seen a few people hurt in my career, and you know, and it it, it happens because if you're a, if you're doing this long enough, and you're at at a level where you're proficient as a professional, sooner or later, it, it's like riding bulls. You know, and rodeo, it'll catch you out. You know, it, it's just got to, the odds are there. It's like being in the military. You get deployed in 10 deployments, you know, sooner or later, the numbers catch up with you, you know? Yeah. The, the possibility. Um, it's those kind of analogies, but, you know, like going again, another Chris film, Dunkirk. You know, I was convinced that one of the ways we could shoot, uh, we could have our actors in the cockpit of what looked like a Spitfire a real aeroplane, and we bring the real spits up beside them, and then they could fold off together. So I convinced Chris and the DOP Hoyter that we could do this. So Chris was like, you've picked an aeroplane. I was like, yes. Where, where, where can I find one? I said, there's one in Denton, Texas. And I was in Los Angeles. He said, go get a check from Warner's and go and buy it. We're going to make a camera plane where we can put the IMAX camera on the outside and on the inside and have a pilot fly from the second seat and the actors can be up front, convert it to look like a Mark One Spitfire, and get all those aerial shots. So we're literally in the air for real, not on a green screen or a digital uh, volume. We're there doing it. And you know, Chris was so pleased that I pushed for that. And that's one of the things that I was very proud of as as doing that. And Chris did also say that in the. Um, I don't really do a lot of interviews, Matthew, at all. There's very few out there of mine. Um, and I did, I didn't do, I don't think I even did one for Dunkirk. Um, but, um, in the behind the scenes, he, he gave me credit for it. And it was obviously there's a lot of pushing and, uh, you know, his DOP is incredible, Hoyter. And Hoyter was like, I think it's going to be amazing. That was him. He, he's so positive. He's like, it's going to be amazing. Let him put the camera on the outside of an airplane, look like a Spitfire and we'll paint it. And it's not a real Spitfire, but we'll make it look like so we can have a camera ship and, you know, and. We have a real Spitfires there, and we can film our cast. So I love those moments. Well, that, you know? Yeah, that, that is 
just so iconic, you know. I mean, I love that movie. I watched it actually. I hadn't seen it for some time. I mean, you know, another mutual friend of ours worked on that, yeah. um, and I hadn't watched it. And then I, I, I don't know why, because I love, I love Chris's work. You know, I, I think I watch anything that he does. Although I believe it or not, I haven't seen Oppenheimer yet. But um. You know that that creative push and that willingness to do right that you have to be the that there's enough people that as you know right because you come up against it there's enough people that would just get on set and they'll be like okay I'll do what you say right they're not necessarily pushing for excellence or pushing to do something that is memorable or and I, I don't mean new for the sake of it right that I, but but you know you you are creative within that and I mean not just as a second unit director but creative within the stunt process. So yeah. can you tell me a little bit about about the process on Inception? Because that, to me, was – I remember watching that and going, before I knew you, I was like, I, I don't know how they did this. Like, this is just staggering amount of work, like, just brilliant. If you, you know, if you're a technician in the industry, right, you look at that and you're like, that's a virtuoso performance right there. Yeah. Yeah. Inception was, was an amazing <clears throat> film for me. Um, that was my first, um, as overall in charge with Chris, uh, that was my first one. Um, you know, I'd worked with him with the other films, but I wasn't the overall boss at all, all worked with him. But, um, that was to be, to give a backstory, to be listening to Chris and to read that script. I think at one point there was only like three scripts, maybe four scripts in the world. You know, Wally, the first AD, uh, the designer, Nathan, and myself had one. I think I was the first person to be allowed to take one outside the United States under lock and key. Uh, Chris is so secretive about these things, and, and I know the reason, and that's probably why one of the reasons I don't usually give interviews, but also yeah. uh, I don't normally talk about a project I'm working on, but I'm not working on any now, so I'm looking for one. But in that process, so... You know, we did, there was Nathan and, and Wally and, and myself and Chris. We we did all these director scouts together. It's unusual for a stunt coordinator to be on them, but Chris trusts very much like, he was like, just wait there for a little while. Let me go and have a look, for example, at this building or or creatively let me think about it. And I'll tell you what I'm thinking. And then you let me know what you think if, if we can achieve that. So we'll do that. And that's how the process will go. And then when it came to the, um, the sequence of the zero G Chris Cobalt special effects was amazing. They built this, you know, hundred foot long life sized uh, corridor that was revolving. And when it came to the fight, I knew that I had to get something a little different because uh, we did the corridor piece, but what, where I wanted to take it to the next level wasn't achievable in the corridor. So I went to production. I said, look, I'd love to have like 180 feet tall, corridor that's in the vertical situation where I can put people on wires and I can manipulate them and and get them floating in that space without moving so they have to fight the space if you know what I mean and out of all of that Joseph Gordon Levitt our cast member was the key it took me nine weeks of rehearsals and figuring things out how to get the action right for his fight in that in the combination of with the special effects of their revolving tunnel and bedroom, etc., for the meat of the fight in the what I had this tunnel built, and then originally the producer actually was like, "No, we don't have the money for that." And I said, "Well, you know, let's take part of my budget and let's build it, and then if it works, then we're all happy." And I and he said, "Well, you know, check with Chris." So I said to Chris my ideas, and Chris was like, "Okay, let him do it." Give him the time. So I did all this. And then, you know, when I do stuff for Chris, I only ever just video it from an outside point of view. I don't cut it together. I don't do any of that because Chris likes yeah. to see it in the rawness and make his own decision about where he wants to have cameras and stuff like that. So previews don't exist. I just just shoot it just straight on. Just let him see what's happening. So I did that from the top and from the bottom. And he really liked what where we were going with it. You know, we still had a long way to go. So then. He managed to give uh, talk to Joseph, and they freed up three weeks for Joseph Gordon-Levitt 
to train every day with the the, the performers that are being cast in the roles of getting killed and fighting, and uh, Rick English and, and another couple of guys, and and um, and then after three weeks, he was like, "How do you feel?" Because it all of that hinged on one person's performance to tell that whole that whole sequence, which was Joseph, and um, he was ready. So he shot that whole sequence. Chris shot that whole sequence in two and a half days. Wow. You know, with Joseph. And, you know, it's very hard. I mean, I like, you know, for example, you go, you know, Tom Cruise does, a, he does do his own. He, he gets someone to get it ready and to uh, a level that's acceptable to him. And he does do his own stunts. And I've got to say, you know, it's very hard in our industry these days to get insurance and underwriters and everyone to sign off on, on, giving people the opportunity to do more. And some people are capable, Matthew. Some people are not built to. I mean, yeah. I know some cast members are like, if it's more than a walk or run up the stairs, I've got a double for that. Or no, I want yeah. to do it. And Joseph, he he just physically was there and he rehearsed it. He did every single shot in that sequence, in the corridor, uh, revolving corridor and bedroom. And then the vertical one that we had built for all the close contact wire work, he did the whole lot. And that's amazing. About, I mean, I, I love him actually. I think he's terrific. He's I one of those guys where you like, huh? I think he's so underrated. I think he's an amazing oh. character. And I think he's an amazing person, really, in all my experience with him. He was very much um, job on, professional, wanting to create the best thing he could do. Yeah, he's very, very good technically as well. I don't yeah. think, like you say, I don't think people really give him the credit for, you know, for being as good as he is. I mean, he's he's a very, very good technical, technically gifted actor as well as, you know, I mean, he, he delivers the performances. But if you watch it and, and if you have an eye, you know, he's very, very precise with oh, what he does. So yeah. And that's what, he's, you know, he sold it. You know, he sold that whole performance. And look, you know, with all the, we did a lot of wire work in that. And with all the manipulation that we do and putting them in, and all it, all it does is I was creating environment for him to be in, for him then to give his performance. And I think for stunt performers, a lot of them, um, they, they forget it's about performance sometimes when they're doing stunts. And, yeah. and I, you know, if I can be critical at all of, of wire work in action movies, I think sometimes stunt performers forget about, especially doing wire work, it's, forget about what the wire can do. It's about your performance when you're in the space that it is providing you to be in. And he took advantage of it. I mean, I, I, he's, a, he's actually a very talented also musician. Um, so he's very technically always wants to be precise. You're right there. And he sold it by being that precise. He's yeah, you know, it's, fu it's funny because, you know, my wife was a ballerina and, and um, a couple of my daughters are too as well. They're learning. And, and when you look at ballet, the whole point of ballet is once you get strong enough, once you get technically gifted enough to do it, is yeah. to make it look easy, right? To make it look like it's a performance, like they're smiling, even though, you know, they're up on point and they're like, you know, every sinew of their body's like, oh, this is really difficult. Even when yeah. it's easier for them, it's difficult. And, and I think that, that you see it with performances sometimes, right? It's the yeah. same in it, with, with, with stunts, you know, if you've got someone that's like, you know, or they're not aware of where the camera is. I mean, it's, it's, it's a real art to get yeah. that. You know, it, I, I tell you this, Tom, so I did, um, I did a film with Michael J. White, and and as you know, like he is the real deal. Like, I mean, that dude is a proper martial artist. He's a brilliant fighter, yeah. and and you know, I'm like, you know, I have a black belt in Taekwondo, but I'm not that level. Like, I mean, he's other level. And yeah. I, I I flew in. Um, I can't remember where we were shooting now. I think it was Vancouver. I flew into Vancouver. And the first day I got in, they were like, Michael wants you to come down to to the the dojo. Or Dojang, you say in Taekwondo, right? Dojo. And so I go down there and I'm like, okay, all right. And I go down and he goes, okay, we're going to run through the, um, the, you know, one of the first fights. We've got it all blocked out. I'm like, all right. 
And it was funny because it was this this guy, bless him, he just opened this place, right? It was brand new. And I looked across and there was a little crack in the drywall, right? Like, I, I, and I remember looking at it and going, hmm. So anyway, we carried on and we started doing the choreography and he was like, okay, this is what you got to do. It's going to be like one, two, duck under, move, kick with a right there, you know, and, and I'm used to that, right? Like I've done, yeah. I've done that a lot. Like, it's not like I'm an actor that hasn't done it. And so I go, he goes, okay. And I'm like, okay, one, two, three, four, four. cause you know, when you obviously as you, as you ramp up, right, Tom, you're getting faster and faster and you want it to look real, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. And, uh, but not too fast, right? You tell people like, you don't want to do it too fast because the camera misses a lot of it. I mean, there's a, there's a real art to that. So, yeah. so anyway, I go, I kind of go one, two, blah, 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 blah. And Michael goes, all right, guys, see you later. I'm off. And I, and I'm like, hang on a minute. I've only just done the one thing, right? I've done one thing. And he goes, oh yeah. He goes, I've worked with people that don't know how to throw a punch. Clearly, you know what you're doing. Um, I know that you're not going to hurt me. Or you're not going to injure yeah. me, right? Yeah. Uh, because, because as you know, like with those guys, like I knew when I was working with Michael J. White, there was no way he was ever going to injure me because he was so good. Uh, you know, he can pull a punch like this fight. Not that it ever has to be that way, right? I mean, obviously, you know, I mean, I'm talking to a master of this. You know, you can be a way, way, way away from people when you depend on the camera position on the punches. But he, you know, he'd been in the situation where number one. I'm sure someone thought they knew what they were doing and, and they hit him or, or her or somebody. Um, and, and also it just doesn't look good, right? It no. just doesn't look good. So he was bugging on out. And, and the funny thing was I did this part where the, the guy comes along and, and he grabs me and I push him back and we go right into the drywall and yeah. we put a dent in the drywall and it caves in because <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't on, um, you know, the studs weren't every like 12 inches. I don't know what it was. And I went, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. And he went, see that one there? We've replaced two of those there because, you know, we've gone into it with the other actors and, and we smashed it up a bit. But Michael was, um, and the funny thing about that was when we actually went to do the scene, and this is just a little thing for the people that are watching. I said to the, um, to the, the, the costume the wardrobe department, I went, listen, you need to give me some flexibility in my groin area because I've got a kick. And if I do not have like something that can stretch there, I'm going to rip my pants. <laughs> like, it's going to happen. Sure enough, dude, first time I come in, I hold like, I got wallop like that. And I, I kick my pants rip all the way up. So I go out and I'm like, oh, oh. so that because of the timing of the stunts, I had to have my double come in who was amazing i mean he made me look like absolutely incredible but he come came in and he started doing the stuff and i go downstairs and i'm sitting there waiting waiting for them to repair my pants so i can go back up and i'm sitting and waiting and you know i mean you can do a stunt and then they'll take an hour two hours to reset to get it right or move things and you know yep. it can take a long time so i was just sitting there and i'm like oh okay whatever i'll wait and then michael came down and went we're done. And I went, what? And he went, oh, I am so sorry. I didn't think that you wanted to do the scene. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like I get to be on screen with Michael J. White fighting. Like, of course I want to do it. Um, and, and he was like, I am so sorry. I was like, dude, no, it's, it's fine. Because you know, these things happen, right? There might, there can be a yeah. little bit of a miscommunication or whatever. But um, uh, let me ask you this, Tom, because I don't want to take any more of your time. We've been on for, for quite a bit. Um, yep. what is the thing that you are most proud of that you have done in your career is, I mean, I know that's a difficult one to get, but there has to be something where you go, I mean, even if it was before you were a coordinator or what, what, what was the thing that you, that you look back on and you go, yeah, I did that. Oh, I, I have been asked that question before. It is so hard to put a finger on it because, honestly, like I say, I've been so fortunate to be part of so many iconic or what became iconic projects. One project that comes to mind, I, I don't think the rest of the world received it probably as as good as, like, your Titanics or your Bravehearts or your, or your Private Ryans, but 
I did a thing called Blood Diamond with Leonardo DiCaprio where I wasn't the overall boss. I was second in charge. I was a stunt supervisor. Paul Jennings was my boss. Um, it was amazing. I was back in Africa. Um, my godfather was a military advisor who'd, who'd fought in three conflicts there. And, and um, a lot of the team that we had I knew from my time in Zimbabwe and and um, – it was amazing. And, and we had amazing locations. Uh, Kevin Delanoy was the producer. You know, uh, Susan Tanner was the UPM. These are people who, they, and we were in South Africa and Mozambique making this movie. I mean, it was so surreal and amazing to do. Like, I remember the art department made this bar on the beach in Mozambique. It was so real. And this is without a word of a lie. We were walking back to our hotel on Friday night after shooting downtown there was people lining up outside. They thought it was a real pub <laughs> and it was on the beach, you know. Um, and that was that was just – and it's amazing. I mean, obviously, I'm in North Africa right now. I'm in Morocco right now. My family's – my mum, uh, my wife's from here, sorry. And um, Africa's um, got deep roots here and I just – it's just amazing place to come back and it has all the levels of everything you want to do. And then the other – uh, one of the other amazing things is it's a little bit of a sidetrack. I've, I've done a couple of, of films in, in Bollywood. And, in fact, I've actually won um, two statues uh, for action directing in Bollywood. Um, and it's called the Filmfare Awards, which are, are I think, are exactly the same age as our Oscars. Mm -hmm. So I've been recognised in Southeast Asia um, for directing, action directing and and um, there's no such thing for us here. So maybe it's one It's crazy, day... isn't it? Isn't it crazy, though, that they don't have an Oscar for, for stunts? Oh, just... Yeah, it is crazy. But you know what? Me personally, I think with my, with my career and experience and, and the knowledge of the people I know and around us, maybe one day I'll get to direct a main unit and um, like Chad and, and um, Brad and, and um, Dave and people like that and... and um, because I think it's the people you have that surround you that makes a good project. Yeah. I mean, I think we all, we all can, we've done hard knocks or whatever, but I think it's even in the acting and, and any part of our business, it's, it's all about the people you have around you. And if you have good, honest people around you, then I think that that's half the battle and road to success. Well, I'll tell you this. I am so excited to see you direct. Like, I'm so oh, excited to see you get yeah. get a hold of because you know, in our conversations, um, it, it it's just you know, you get to meet people that have real talent, right? And I don't just mean that like because you can look as a you know, you look at actors that sometimes they go and direct and they're terrible. Like, they, it's just mm. there's not a transferable skill for them in that in that environment. Then there yeah. are some of them like Clint, like Mel, that, that are yeah. just unbelievable. And same in, with, with the stunt community, I think, that there are certain individuals that – because you can look at the John Wick series uh, and just go, oh, the stunts, the stunts. But the story is what really resonated yeah. with people. People love the stunts, and they're like, okay, it's great. You know, I know Taron, you know, who uh, – yeah. you know, I've done his course with the guns, and, and obviously Keanu is, is – I know multiple people that have worked with him. I mean, uh, Chad, Chad had worked with him on the matrix and he was working with us on, on Rambo and he had nothing but great things to say about Keanu. And I think that he's yeah. probably one of the most, uh, unifying characters in Hollywood because everybody likes him, but, but you get to the point where you're like, okay, Chad clearly understands story. You know, those guys understand yeah. story because you I couldn't just go in there. And, and, and that's the same with you. And I mean, it, and, and it's exciting to me uh, to, to think of your next evolution in your career going from, uh, you are a legend. I mean, you are. No. Uh, Thank you. You are. Uh, and to, but, but to see where that is going to go on the next level is super, yeah. super exciting for me. Oh, thank um, you. And I always remember it was my second time working for Simon Crane thing called Young Indiana Jones series. That's where I first started with him. And he said to me, you know, you might be one of the great stuntmen. You might be a good stuntman. He said, I can't tell right now. I don't know. He said, but unless you learn what's happening on the other side of, of the camera and understand what we're looking at and what's expected, you'll never be any good. 
and yeah. I took that to heart, you know. So it's, 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 that's where it, coming to learn what our business is about, learning what visual effects is, learning what camera is, what the formats are, what they're seeing gives us a better and – and I think that that was the best words of wisdom – that it could have yeah. ever been given by anyone was Simon Crane saying, "Learn what's on the other side of the camera and what we're doing." And um, here we are. Well, you did that. You were the, you've been on set with the greats, right? So you you yes. sit and and it's something that I did all the time. You know, when on the movies that I've done, where everyone else goes, I'm going off to my trailer. I'll go and I'll sit in Video Village, like next to the director, yeah. because you know that. It, I mean, that is a very special place, right? Like it's like the inner sanctum. And you get mm -hmm. to see the way that people look, the way that people cope with things. Um, and and I, th I think that the more, the bigger the things get, like the bigger the directors get, the more, for the most part, I mean, it's not always like that, but the more calm they yes. are. Like, you know, Absolutely. I, I mean, that's what I've seen. And there's no ego uh, unless, no. you know, someone needs to be put in line and understand where they are because they have an ego and they're like, yeah. you know, flexing their muscles around the big ones. But, but like I said, I mean, those guys, they're too busy in their heads, figuring out what they're, what they're going to do. Um, yep. and, and I was asked a ton of questions, right? <laughs> when you can, like, you, you know, you don't want to be yeah. sitting there in the middle of something that's really important and go, hey, you know, what lens is that? Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, why are you asking and, me this? Like, like you say, it's amazing to watch the process of some of the greats I've worked with. You know, like, I, I you know, Spielberg on Private Ryan and then seeing him working with him on Munich. Um, you know, uh, Chris and then Danny. It's when you see how they, like, they bring their cast together. Obviously, all the technical people around that, they've got the best they can get because they're at a level where they can employ the best in the business. So they have the best cameramen, they have the best effects and everyone. And then they take their cast and then they rely on their performances. And honestly, I, I see very little other than giving them the environment and the space. Someone like Chris, you don't see, they, you know, they have their discussions with their cast, etc. But you don't hear him yelling out, oh, start crying, start doing yep. this, start doing that. That's yep. not what yep. – they, they, they don't have to because in their minds they're watching the performance and, they're, and they might have a quiet word and say, well, what about if we did this and, and you know, we adjusted and we came in on the line on there and, and they use their camera work to help tell the story too. So it's, it's a whole combination. And um, I find that process, like you've just touched on, amazing – from the people who are really great and what we consider in our day and age now to be amazing directors and amazing technical people and DOPs and that. It's good to see them apply their craft. And I really, I'm very much like you in that respect. I love to listen and see what they do. And if I don't know, I'll ask that question. Sometimes it's probably not the smartest thing to do is ask these questions because Sometimes you're expected to know, but how can you know if you don't ask? That's yeah. also in my agenda, you know? Well, I think yeah. that if you, you're humble, I think people respect that. Like I, I always tell people, like, you don't have to bullshit, right? You can just say, no. I don't know. Uh, yeah. I need to learn that. Like, and that's, that's yeah. an admirable – I think that's an admirable, admirable quality yeah. in someone that I can go, hey, Tom, listen, what do, you what do you think about this? Like I've been thinking this, but what do you think about that? And, and I don't know this, and how can, how can I learn that? I think it's very, yeah. very important. And, and uh, I mean, it's done you all right, hasn't it? <laughs> it's done well. Look, honestly, I'm not everyone's cup of tea um, because I can be outspoken. I can get – i got to be careful because you've got to think. Sometimes you get very tunnel vision. I, I've got to make it happen. I've got to get the best I can. Where sometimes you've got to broaden that and take a step back and let other things happen so that then you can do your job too. I think that comes with age. I think that's with anything. I think, I think um, with, uh, with age comes responsibility and knowledge. So hopefully we all yeah, learn wisdom. by it. And I think, wisdom. Yeah, right? you wisdom. get wisdom and, with and, it. You know, yeah. I, I'm a great lover of history and the history of, all kinds, doesn't matter whether it's film or, or war or whatever it might be. And, and I think that if we look at our history and, and learn by it and then we can take that little bit of wisdom we have and apply it to our trade. So that's what I try to do a lot, you know. Well, Tom, I am so grateful that you took the time to talk to me. I mean, you know, you're a, you're a good friend. Uh, I'm very oh, grateful you. for your friendship. 
And yeah. I'm very grateful that you you came on and spent the time with me on here. And, and I know that a lot of people out there are going to really, really appreciate your wisdom and your guidance. And, and hopefully we can spawn uh, more filmmakers in the old, I hate to say in the old, like in the old kind of like mold, you know, in the old mold, but, but just great filmmakers, you know. Yeah, and, and I think great filmmakers, any, any great filmmaker, you know, I, I see and, you know, even you go all the way back through history, all your great technicians and your filmmakers and that, all very creative people, all work very hard, you know, they don't rely thinking that like our kids' society now, a lot of it is, oh, oh, I should have that. Well, no, you've got to earn. You know, and, yeah. and and I think that we run the risk of being spoiled. And I think we're guilty of it a little bit, especially for our own children, because, you know, where I grew up, it was quite I, – I grew up in the middle of Australia. It was, it was quite harsh outback, you know, chasing cows and riding horses and all that kind of stuff. And like it was done back in the States in the 30s, like in the 80s and 90s in Australia. And um, I think it, it stood me well. You know, yeah. like my dad said to me once – how do you know to work if you're not taught how to work? Yeah. And always remember that. So, you know, and um, he said, if you don't know how to, if you're not taught how to work, if I don't make you get up at 6 a.m. and go out and, and fix fences and windmills and chase cows and then go to school, he said, how are you going to know in future life? At the time I was thinking, uh, this is not the best time, not, the, not what I want to be doing, you know. And as kids, that's what we did. But that's the kind of environment I grew up in. So I think it's, it's really done me a lot of good. Um, it's not for everybody, but I think it, it really helped and it taught me a set of morals and principles and always do the best I can with the tools I have and the job I have, you know? Well, firstly, God bless good dads, right? And, you know, my, yeah. I, had a, I had a friend of mine around here the other day and he turned around to my 17-year-old and he said, you know what, son? He goes, the older you get, the smarter your dad becomes. Yeah. And I was like... Dad because it's true right you get older and you're like at the mo at that moment you don't want to hear it you know you, no. you you know why am i getting up why am i doing this i mean now it's like why am i cleaning my room right i mean that's that's how far we've come uh, and it's yeah. it's like look and I, I literally had a chat with my son last night i said son you know you might not like a lot of the stuff that i'm saying and the the interesting thing for me is, you know, I've got like adult children and I've got a, mm. I've got a one-year-old. And I said, but my, mm. when I look at you, you're still like that one-year-old to me. Like, right. You yeah. still, and I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way, but I've lived a lot of life and mm. I love you, right. As a dad, but that doesn't mean enabling you in any kind of dysfunction or enabling you to go down the wrong path. And it's difficult sometimes. It's it's a it's a lonely life being a father because you you have to be okay with being disliked by your kids, right? Because yep. you're not meant to be their friend. You're meant to be their dad, uh, and that is putting those boundaries. And uh, and again, like I said, uh, the older you get, the smarter your dad becomes, right? <laughs> because you're like, yeah, no, he set me up for life. I didn't like it at the yeah. time, but he set me up for yeah, life. Yeah, um, exactly. And. I can see I'm very much in parallel with you. I've got a 25 and a 23 and a three-year-old. So there's 20 years and one week between my last two. And it's a different ball game again, you know, and I thought I was past that over the age of the hill of wanting to do that also. But it's amazing. And, you know, my, my first two children were amazing. Um, and then touch wood, they've turned into amazing young adults. And um, I hope that I can do a really good job with it, this latest edition because he's an amazing little fellow. And um, like you say, sometimes it is the loneliest place on the planet to be. And I think when you reach, wherever you reach in life, if you reach your goals and you achieve that, especially in our business, going back to the film business, it is a very lonely position when you become yeah. the head of department or directing or whatever, because there's five, 500 other people below would like to do the same job. Yeah. Uh, and, and they think they can as well, by the way. They think they can. Yeah. They're like, what, you know, why is he doing that? Like, uh, so, yeah. yeah. And, they, and they do. And, you know, not every, not every, everyone has an opinion and it's a very healthy thing. So, and not every opinion is acceptable and not every way is the right way or the wrong way. So, yeah. and I always remember now, none of us are infallible and um, 
there's always someone out there that will do the job. Maybe it, you won't see it as good as you, you won't see them doing as good as you are, or maybe they'll do it better. But there's always someone who can do it. That's like they always say, there's a bigger kid on the block. And yeah. I think it has relevance too with what we do, you know? Well, Tom, I've loved this conversation as I always do our oh, thank conversations. You. It came out <laughs> so the blue again, this morning, for, well, this afternoon for me, but it was coming out the blue, but it's always an absolute pleasure and I love it. And um, let's talk again soon. I like that. Right on. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much. Bye, Matthew. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Mike. Bye.